Thank you. All right. <laughs> now we'll start. So, um, first, what, why is it just a vision? So we already have seen a lot of progress in working with Transmart and uh, a lot of uh, great science that is done with it. But BI is not yet using Transmart as a productive tool. So we are right now uh, running some instances. And uh, what we are in the process of doing is to try to understand the opportunities and challenges. So that is why I cannot give you really highly sophisticated data. But what I'll show you is uh, what is the strategy and how Transmart um, could be a part of our strategic, strategic thinking in uh, translational research. And uh, the first step that we already have done is the identification of opportunity. So we had, assisted by the Hive, a number of interviews within BI and uh, um, we're trying to elucidate, okay, what, what are the gaps and um, the opportunities that we have. And I'll come to this a bit later. First, uh, because this is the first time um, BI is represented in this community, just two slides on who we are and uh, what we're doing. So Beringer Ingelheim is a family owned corporation founded in 1885 in Germany. Our research site actually is in Lake Constance, very nice um, area. We have more than 47,000 employees and uh, spend about uh, 2.6 billion in research, which is about 20% our revenues, which is pretty standard for the industry, if I remember correctly. Our main focus TAs are immunology and respiratory diseases. So we have a combination of immunology and respiratory diseases because there is a lot of overlap. We have oncology, we have cardiometabolic diseases. Again, there we have diseases of the heart and the vascular system combined with metabolic diseases because there is such an overlap and diseases of the central nervous system. But that is it regarding the eye. So as you know, and this has been shown a number of times already today, it is all about translational science. So we have discovery and we have the clinical research and in between we have kind of a translation. So we have the famous bench to bat side. Um, actually the, there are a lot of definitions and there is a um, there are a lot of ways of describing what is translational and what is translational science. I will not read this because this is yet another. Um, for me, the most important point is that it is collaboration and exchange between the scientists and the clinicians. The major issue here, as far as we can see it, and I've taken this from a presentation that were given by Peter Kaufman actually, so um, is that Scientists and physicians could be from different phyla. So there is a different training, philosophy, motivation, and research style. And this is what we are dealing with right now. And I'll give you a bit more insight into this as well. So it is not just the technological hurdle that we have to overcome, but it is a cultural and a sociological um, hurdle as well. And as you can see here, the statement is from 1990, and it's still um, valid. So not a lot has changed during these um, 25 years. So what, what is the overall issue um, within the eye? And I uh, apologize if, if I show some no-brainers. So a lot of these things have already been shown and are pretty clear. Um, what I would like to do is to really um, show the thinking within BI and just to make the point that and how, how we think about these topics. And um, the major thing that we see is that there is a good data transfer from research to medicine, within research and within medicine, but the learning from medicine back to research is underrepresented. So what we would like to um, introduce is a more patient-centric research to um, utilize the data that is captured in medicine more into research questions. And I guess this is what everybody is aiming at. So we, we call it patient-centric. And uh, uh, 
what are the promises of uh, the patient-centric um, research and the patient-centric drug development cycle. So it is not the broad disease, but it is specific sets of subjects. And you have different etiologies of diseases, and you would like to really look into the um, etiologies and not the overall disease. Um, this enables a smoother transition through the clinical phases. And um, by incorporating this knowledge already in new therapeutic concept research. So not just stepping into this phase when reaching the clinic, but starting with clinical data in research and already um, deliver this streamlined data into the clinic. Um, guide biomarker strategy early in the discovery processes, so as we pretty much know, we need to deliver biomarkers uh, in, in uh, oncology, and it becomes more and more obvious that we will have to do this in other indications sooner or later as well. And um, yeah, then the potentially smaller market, uh, but you will have a more cost-effective development, which is good for the authorities. And what I will focus on today is the back translation, so that you have the option to utilize the knowledge from the clinical trials that were performed within the company um, to inform and improve next trials, and not just to do that, but to um, allow uh, to do more and better new therapeutic concept research. <clears throat> And now this is actually, uh, I was very happy about the discussion that we had this morning. So about, okay, we, we need a foundation, that's true, but we need users and customers and uh, how to suit these users and customers. And uh, I, did, he, I listed here uh, the different topics that we were asked in the context of translational science. And what are the questions that need to be answered? And this is not, okay, I need a new drug and uh, I, I need to understand this type of cancer. These are very um, easy to answer questions as soon as you have the respective infrastructure. And uh, so in new therapeutic concept research, uh, what, what is known about the topic of interest? So that might sound easy to answer, but it is not at this point in time because uh, we are lacking the interactive infrastructure. Or uh, could a specific measurement do be, be derived from the tissue of interest? So RNA or protein expression, this is a question that we get asked, and uh, it is easy to answer, but uh, it is not with Transmart as of yet. So you need another layer to um, be exposed to the actual customer where he can ask these easy questions. Or do we find a correlation of a specific measurement with clinical parameters of interest? Again, easy to be answered, but not with Transmart as of yet. And there are a number of others. I will not go into a lot of details here. Um, uh, there, there are more sophisticated ones to be answered. What are the detailed characteristics of the mode of action of my compound? And there I need a lot of uh, data, a lot, I need more sophisticated infrastructure and analysis, and um, this will not be answered by a biologist, a bench scientist, just hitting a button. So still there are pieces needed that suit these um, types of answers. But these easy to answer questions, these are those that uh, our customers are answering um, every day and are exposed to every day, and uh, these are the ones that, w that then convinces them about the utility of an infrastructure piece. Um, what do we have to become more patient-centric? So stepping away from the animal models, cellular models, but really to go into the patients, and uh, yeah, just with some examples of my projects so that you have a lot of data. You have partnerships like uh, patients like me, clinical sites, Mount Sinai, uh, large-scale genomics um, initiatives like Genomics in uh, England or Consortia. And these were already mentioned today. And you have the in-house trial data. And uh, so there, there's a wealth in as well by, by utilizing them. So point I'd like to make is there is a lot. And there is a lot to integrate, to combine, to analyze. There are very different data types, very different sources of information. 
very different legal and ethical issues. And, uh, but these are the ones that we face right now. And this is just an overview about the IMI projects that BI is involved in. <clears throat> and I guess that every other pharma company has at least as many IMI projects and all deliver data, all deliver samples, all deliver um, analysis and results. Do we really utilize what we get there? So I would say, no, we don't. So we, we have some focused projects where we are more involved than in others. But I would not say that we get the best out of all these projects um, as one, one could. Um, so what, what are the, um, what, what is the, so this is about the central part of the strategy that we have and this is called, a, oops, I'm sorry. This is called the uh, Biospecimen Initiative. And this is aiming at making data and samples collected in BI's clinical trials available to, to the customers. And there you have different challenges. And these uh, challenges are cultural. So you have strong stakeholders in different units and you need to convince them. So primarily in medicine to, to really share their data. And this is within BI, so this is not collaboration stuff, but this is really within BI. And then the, the ethical issues that you have to protect the data and um, that you have to make best use of the material collected during the trials. And this was already mentioned in the keynote and I'll not go into a lot of details here. Um, and you have the technological issues, diverse data types, high dimensional data and curated legacy data. And uh, you're pretty much familiar with this. So now the biospecimen initiative is aiming at collecting the biospecimen with the trials and uh, it's driven by medicine with part participation of research and we'd like to address those challenges. And there are a lot of stakeholders right now within BI trying to get this going and try to find ways um, to make these samples and data really available to research. And those stakeholders are quality and auditing, data protection and legal at first. So these are the constraints that we have. Um, it is not that medicine and research are the, the, the roadblocks, so to speak. So there still are those um, cultural challenges, but uh, the challenges that we have from GCP environment and so on are much harder to circumvent than, than the cultural challenges. And so what, what is it all about? So, you have the informed consent form and uh, we're really heavily working on this trade-off between ethical legal considerations and the future utility of the collected data and samples. So every single person has to sign this informed consent form and uh, has to understand what is written there. So for us, the most easy way would be to just, just say, okay, your data can be used in this trial, that's it. But by doing so, we would not have the whole utility of the data. and um, so we have to be a bit more broader. But then again, you have the issue that patients might not understand and ethical authorities may not agree to this consent. On the other hand side, um, is it really justifiable to not use these data and samples? Because it drives research and it leads to better treatment. And then another uh, important part is that you need auditable processes. Um, especially from data protection and quality and an audit might be conducted on the basis of the SOPs that you generated by um, formulating these processes and the system that you have needs to be audible, auditable. And the general principle that we have is as soon as we have decisions that lead to, or as soon as we have analysis that lead to decisions in medicine, everything that we do has to be performed in a GCP in a good clinical um, practice environment. And um, so the question, and I cannot answer this, maybe somebody has some experience with it. Is TransMart ready for this? Actually, I don't think so. Um, if this is not the case, so for example, when performing NTC research or biomarker ID, no GCP environment is needed. So that might be applicable for TransMart. 
when saying no GCP environment, it still has to be a controlled environment. So it still has to be um, auditable and it still has to follow some rules. And um, yeah, I, I put here transport is applicable. I, actually, I don't know whether it is in every detail. So this is something that we're looking into right now. So what is the overall vision? And here I'm uh, preaching to the choir, I guess. Um, you have a larger number of data. In this case, it is just diabetes. And it's just showing how it, and it's just, yeah, a snapshot on what we, we have there. So we have IMI projects, we have consortia, we have GEO, we have GWAS. And I did not put the internal data here. So it's a lot from diverse sources. And I don't think that I need to go into a lot of details uh, within this audience. And um, the overall process that we will be aiming at is that you have the subjects, you have Transmart, and you have some kind of analysis, you have some kind of reporting, and then you deliver this to the customer. And this already shows our view on a certain model that one could follow. And uh, this is uh, that, that you have an infrastructure piece and you have a clear interface for the data transfer and that, that kind of formulates the clear rules for accessing, using, and uh, reporting the data and that via this interface, um, the data gets pushed into the not validated infrastructure that still has some defined processes and that then could be transmart. Um, so, <clears throat> the important point here is that this is still an arrow that goes from um, the right to the left because uh, you can um, move the data from the validated infrastructure into the not validated infrastructure under certain circumstances, but the way back is not really possible. If you want to go back to medicine, you have to revalidate your results. So you can generate results within your research infrastructure by using Transmart, but as soon as you would like to use, say, for example, identified biomarker in a clinical trial, all this has to be redone and, and, and revalidated. So how do we see Transmart positioned then? Um, and, and we had a number of discussions uh, regarding this. Um, we really see it as a integration tool. So it is meant to integrate clinical with experimental data and maybe use for cohort selection. Then we have all these specific, sophisticated, um, already used in a number of um, labs and institutions tools to run analysis and visualization. And actually at BI, we have CBIO portal, we have gene data, we have Spotfire. We use R a lot, so this is our shiny, but whatsoever, we use R a lot. And um, what we are doing right now with the Transmart installation that we have, we're really pulling data out of Transmart and then feeding this into these tools to run analysis and visualization. Um, I'm not so sure about this one. So what I see is that there is a need for storage of really high dimensional data that is not transmart as of yet. So if we get a great core that is able to do that, um, I'd be more than happy to, to use it. But as of yet, uh, it, it needs to be something else. So transmart really will be the translational tool to capture um, information and then create the link between the high dimensional data stored somewhere and the analysis tools uh, on, on the other side. So what are the really challenges uh, that we face? And these are just buzzwords, but this is what we feel needs to be improved. Uh, and this is scalability, so Transmart does not scale to an extent that would make BI happy. Security, um, we see still some gaps in the security um, concept of Transmart, reproducibility means auditability actually. So when we get audited, we have to make sure that we can really reproduce what we did and uh, this would include what we did within Transmart. And then obviously the analysis and visualization 
and finally the user experience. What um, honestly this does not have to be Transmart, but the user experience is a very important point and I'd be happy to use Transmart as the data backend and then generate an additional layer that has a great user experience. And then the final slide. So the hope is that by putting these two a bit closer together, we finally are transformed and that there is a cultural change and that there is a better collaboration between medicine and research and a deeper understanding and hopefully leading to better medicines suiting our patients. And having said that, thank you very much. Thanks, Carson. Um, we're right at the time, but I, if, if there are one or two questions, I think we can take them. Um, and if there aren't, I have a question. Okay. Um, I mean, this is actually the first time I've seen mention of the idea of Transmart, even the idea, even the, the prospect of Transmart being uh, a G, GXP compliant system. Um, but so, and I haven't heard of that uh, being on the table anywhere. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, from your point of view, it would still it still has a place, even if it's not a compliant system. Sure. If it's just being used to yeah. formulate hypotheses for further, exactly. further validation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and I guess it will be extremely difficult to really make it a GS, GXP um, yeah. compliance system. So th this was just a thought. Right. So yeah. I don't think that this will ever happen. Yeah. So uh, we will still have to revalidate the findings that we generated. I do agree. I do understand and agree with you, though, that you know, short of GXP, there is a there is a zone that we need to be in where the system is documented well enough, supportable well enough that you could convince, even if you were making a voluntary genomic data submission, for example, uh, you could convince a regulator that that that, that data are, those data are solid. So anyway. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you very much.